Hi, everyone. Uh, the uh, idea for this is for, for it to, I mean, we, we came up with the series almost like two years ago. Uh, the idea for this is to be fairly like informal and uh, conversational. Uh, we will be having some, we'll be doing a couple of presentations, laying out some basic material. Uh, but the idea for this is that there is kind of opportunity for discussion, right? So um, let's kind of, our, our format for this is more uh, round table-y than lecture -y in our like brains, uh, assuming that this would be spatialized at the school <laughs> online, like just kind of, I guess, everyone pretend the logic of this is for that we're all around the table, although it's fairly large amount of people. It's kind of consequence of the online format as well, I guess. Um, so we will have, um, uh, a kind of short presentation, a couple of short presentations. We will make a presentation that will be probably around 20 minutes. Uh, Eleni will make a presentation that will be around 15. Uh, but the idea of this is that we're gonna have like a, a period of discussion in between the first and the second, and then the second period of discussion after the second one. And the idea is that uh, we want people, we want to be able to engage with the material on a conversational basis. Uh, so, Anyone who would like to make any question or any comment, uh, engage in discussion on the themes, please just do the normal thing, raise your hand and we'll unmute and we'll actually have kind of uh, audience engagement. Uh, if you prefer, you can just leave the question in the chat. We'll note it down. Uh, this will be recorded. So uh, have that in consideration <laughs> for uh, if you want to show your faces or not or whatever. And um, yeah, so the, um, we should probably start the uh, actual uh, slideshow, right? Well, um, welcome to the first of uh, three open sessions on political economy. Um, we imagine this uh, since this, ha this has been a kind of a, co a continuous source of um, discussion and material uh, is initially in the uh, uh, wills and and in my diploma courses that kind of more, were more or less systematically intersecting. Uh, it's also been something that's been more or less appearing constantly uh, in HTS teaching in general, uh, in second, third year, and even in first year as well. So it felt for it felt to us that it made sense to have uh, a series focused on this. Um, so we are we organize in three open sessions. The idea again is that it's going to be more discussion-y and conversational than just lecture-y. And the um, uh, this false, first first session uh, we're calling it a crisis of climate, crisis of capital, false choices uh, to introduce some kind of basic uh, notions uh, of how political economy establishes a kind of a foundation on which all of the other dimensions of the current crisis, of the multiple crises, uh, are grounded on, and uh, political economy establishes also kind of the, uh, uh, the level at which they probably need to be discussed and addressed. Um, and we, and uh, so we'll make a short introduction uh, to the issue as we see it. Uh, we'll discuss about it a bit. Eleni will then uh, lay down some like basic concepts of political economy. We can then discuss that as well afterwards. Session two, we will be approaching the crucial category of the New Deal, that uh, the Green New Deal now is obviously in everyone's minds. Uh, and in the final third open session, uh, two weeks from now, uh, some basic principles of Marxist political economy, uh, which we call the long run, and how we need to read the problem as of the multiple crises as relating to the crisis that is now structural of capitalism. We will have a symposium on Friday next week uh, in the afternoon into the evening, a radical reform revolution, fairly uh, larger event with a different format. You're all welcome to be here. So uh, let's go. Oh, and uh, yeah, okay, well, we should probably mute ourselves to
Thanks, Rick. Uh, yeah, so the first session, uh, false choices, crisis of climate, crisis of capital. Maybe we can add another little disclaimer, which, uh, yeah, more conversational. And also, like, we are not political economists. Um, we're not trained political economists. Uh, this isn't meant to be an academic uh, presentation of the kind that we publish in a peer-reviewed journal of political economy. Uh, we're trying to open up a discussion around political economy and architecture. Um, so we'd like to talk about technical details, but um, there, there are things we can't probably discuss today. We'd like to kind of start building this discussion together uh, over these sessions and into next year and beyond. Um, yeah, so let's start. Uh, so the subtitle of this session is Crisis of Climate, Crisis of Capital. Since our aim in this series is really to focus on political economy, uh, it, would, it would seem more obvious that we would begin with a discussion of the current economic crisis, like a more obviously economic discussion than beginning with climate change. So maybe talking about architectural aspects like the deepening, deepening of the housing crisis, how that connects to the subprime mortgage crisis, uh, rent and evictions and so forth. Uh, we would like to talk about that later on, but we thought that we'd begin with climate change. Uh, and I think to follow the metaphor of this cartoon, uh, the multiple crises we experience today, the tsunami waves uh, drawn, uh, are the product of uh, seismic activity, right? Uh, and for us, understanding political economy is like understanding the understanding that seismic activity, understanding the movement of the tectonic plates, which make up uh, the structure of society and how so, uh, human society relates to the natural world. Uh, so in order to make this point and make an argument for, for looking at political economy, uh, we're beginning with climate change, something that many of us at the AA are obviously thinking and talking quite a bit about. So let's start with, uh, with a rough description of kind of the two major kinds of mainstream environmentalism. So this obviously doesn't really describe environmentalism overall. There are much more nuanced and rigorous uh, movements, theories, ideas out there. But let's start at kind of the surface level. Uh, on the one hand, there's the techno-optimistic uh, version, uh, which relies on a kind of confidence in human nature and human innovation. Uh, according to this uh, version broadly, humans are inherently innovative and creative, problem solving. We can switch from cars to electrical cars. We can trust our genius innovators like uh, Elon Musk, uh, the architect of tomorrow here, uh, to lead us into a new sustainable future. Uh, then on the other hand, we have a more critical perspective, which we'll call Malthusian pessimism. Uh, what that means, obviously, we're going to get more, more into it in a sec. The counter argument often begins with the finite resources that even alternative sustainable technologies require. Rare earth minerals, uh, things like lithium that Tesla's batteries depend upon, uh, are also a limited resource. So it's no good switching from consuming fossil fuels to uh, consuming lithium through batteries. Um, this film, I don't know if everyone has seen it, Planet of the Humans, it's kind of controversial uh, film about a documentary about the sustainability movement that pointed out some of these contradictions in popular sustainability technologies and organizations. Uh, so according to this more critical perspective, what we need to do is to stop consuming uh, in general, uh, to stop growth. Um, but how do we do that? I think the trap here is to think only in terms of consumption, growth as growth of consumption, uh, and to think of consumption as a kind of natural human greed. Uh, if humans are just greedy and ultimately destructive, uh, then the only solution from this perspective is to somehow control the human population. And uh, this documentary kind of, while looking at some of the political and economic things related to climate change, ends up basically just showing a graph of population growth and saying population growth is the problem. 
So obviously there are more political versions of environmental activism or climate justice activism. A different version of the critical perspective links the environmental movement to a political struggle against capitalism. This is a photo of young communists at an Extinction Rebellion march uh, in London last year. Uh, but this, uh, this, this position is uh, fairly controversial, even within a radical movement like XR. In fact, this particular banner elicited a direct response from the Extinction Rebellion official Twitter account, which said, just to be clear, we are not a socialist movement. We do not trust any single ideology. We trust the people chosen by sortition to find the best future for us all through a citizens assembly. A banner saying socialism or extinction does not represent us. Uh, but which, uh, which people are implied here? Who do we trust? Can they be chosen at random by sortition? Has everyone equally benefited from the development that is causing the climate crisis? Is everyone equally at risk of suffering the consequences of climate, climate change? How does the struggle for the environment actually connect to other struggles? Uh, is it purely by chance or is there a structural connection between the climate of crisis, neocolonialism, racial oppression uh, and capitalist exploitation? And I think arguably this tweet uh, set off the real controversy uh, because it, uh, a section of Extinction Rebellion activists argued in response that the banner in fact did represent them. So there was an internal debate uh, over what the political uh, program of Extinction Rebellion actually would be and how it relates to larger political questions. So without this political dimension uh, and ultimately political economic dimension, we argue, uh, we risk falling into a trap. Um, optimism or pessimism at the level of consumption and human nature is basically a false choice. And it leads one into a position that uh, is powerless to alter the real economic, political and climactic forces at work in the climate crisis. So whether one's optimistic or pessimistic, climate catastrophe will happen uh, and people will be sorted uh, in one way or another. Uh, and I think techno-utopian visions like Big's Oceanics project here probably contain a kernel of truth for the pessimistic side as well. Uh, this is uh, an image from the famously terrible post-apocalyptic film Waterworld of 1995. I don't know if this is a completely out of date reference, but, and that's the villain uh, played by Dennis Hopper there. Okay, let's move to the second part of the presentation where I think we need to start focusing in on how interhuman relationships shape anthropogenic climate change. So moving from the Anthropocene kind of uh, human species level description to a description at the level of political economy. These two diagrams uh, describe, I think, the common sense notion of what is going on here. Uh, on the one hand, there is the stable and harmonious ecosystem represented by the top oval diagram. And on the other, there is this, the uh, out of control spiraling human growth on the bottom. Needless to say, this schematic diagram, these, this schematic distinction is not really accurate. First of all, the earth is not a stable and harmonious system. Uh, which should be clear from the evidence of non-anthropogenic geological layers on the Earth's crust. Uh, nor obviously is the universe itself stable and harmonious as uh, laws of thermodynamics should make pretty clear. But I think for the timescale we're looking at, uh, we can kind of assume a level of relative stability. We don't want to fall into the kind of bad faith argument about uh, climate change being just natural. Uh, at, th at that level. Okay, the second issue here is that uh, these two systems obviously can't really be separated in the end because the human species is after all part of the Earth's ecology. Uh, nevertheless, for pretty good reasons, the climate, cri climate crisis is generally conceptualized as a, as a uh, contradiction between these two systems, natural and human or natural and artificial or whatever. 
So let's transition to a version of this distinction or contradiction from the history of economics. So Thomas, Mal Thomas Malthus uh, was an English economist uh, around the turn of the 19th century. And in his work, we find an early version of the conflict between human growth and uh, uh, environmental limits, let's say. So in his work, an essay on the principle of population published in 1798, Malthus theorized more or less that there were environmental limits to economic growth. Since humans reproduce exponentially, while they can only cover the surface of the earth uh, geometrically, there is an inevitable contradiction between population growth, which curves up exponentially, and food production, which at best goes up geometrically until you reach the limits of the Earth's surface. Um, when the modern environmental movement took off in the 70s, uh, in part as a reaction to other historical factors, uh, Malthus remained kind of the basic theoretical model. And we can clearly see uh, elements of his theories reemerging in popular books like Paul and Anne Ehrlich's Population Bomb of 1968 or The Limits to Growth of 1972 published by the Club of Rome. So at face value, Malthus appears to be the canonical environmentalist economist. Uh, but what was the historical context of his argument? Malthus bears a lot in common with the physiocrats, a group of French 18th century economists who contested earlier ideas of wealth. <coughs> so the physiocrats challenged mercantilism, which was a notion of wealth that sort of dominate, predominated in the previous centuries before the, the Enlightenment. A notion of wealth which generally defined uh, early colonial activity, particular, particularly Spanish colonialism, which was mostly concerned with taking gold and silver from the colonies, shipping it back to Spain and stashing it in the royal treasure chests. And the amount of gold and silver contained in the royal treasury was equal to the amount of wealth, basically. So this notion of wealth was challenged theoretically by the physiocrats uh, around the same time as it was being challenged practically by the arrival and overtaking colonial practices of France and England, who were starting to outcompete Spain in the colonial, intercolonial struggle. So rather than stolen gold from the colonies, uh, wealth for Malthus or the physiocrats before him came basically from agriculture. Uh, after all, at the end of the day, uh, wealth has to be useful and people can't eat gold. Doesn't matter how much gold you pile up if it doesn't uh, equalize usable wealth, it's, it's pointless. So in agriculture, so the argument went, human labor extracts value from the earth and the earth here is ultimately the source of all wealth. So by the time of Malthus's writing though, this kind of physiocratic notion was, was becoming controversial and being challenged by what we think of today as the mainstream of political economy. People like Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, and eventually also Karl Marx argued that wealth was produced by human labor, not merely extracted from the land. And I reuse the same painting to show that uh, for classical political economy, it's the focus is on the people here, their implements, the technology, their social organization and so forth. Um, so the premise of classical political economy was that humans produce and consume in a complex and dynamic relationship with natural resources rather than merely taking uh, from nature what nature offers. So those ideas uh, of the other classical political economists were far more accurate and powerful than Malthus's, it turned out, uh, especially, especially Marx's. Um, and we can, we can say that Marx's, sorry, we can say now that Malthus's theory is, is basically just false. Uh, its exclusive focus on consumption completely misses the way political economy actually works. Uh, and Malthus was proven wrong over the course of the following centuries as population growth and food production both grew exponentially. And today it's pretty obvious that the basic theory is wrong uh, because poverty and famine today uh, are not related to underproduction of food uh, on the earth, but to problems of distribution and accumulation of wealth. Um, 
So nevertheless, Malthus has remained influential, both for environmental movements and even, it has to be said, for eugenicists and racists uh, who revive Malthus's theory as a weapon against the masses of poor and colonized peoples, basically blaming them for their own poverty. This continued attraction to Malthus from widely different angles uh, is possible because there appears to be a kernel of truth here, uh, at least in the, in the idea of limits to growth. Today, we have a larger view of resource extraction consu and consumption uh, than just uh, food production and population. We include other kinds of resource extraction, like mineral and fossil fuels, obviously, but also other kinds of conflicts like environmental destruction, loss of biodiversity, changes in atmospheric composition, uh, CO2 levels, and so forth. We have a better understanding of the complex interconnection between all these factors, and we definitely see human societies reaching different kinds of environmental limits and transgressing them in destructive ways, even if that doesn't manifest itself in like obvious underproduction of food. But still, we tend to think of the problem in the limited terms of growth as growth of human consumption, butting up against natural constraints. When those constraints reach their ultimate limits, we are back at the same Malthusian endgame. Now, anyone who's in my diploma class knows I like to use this slide. <laughs> uh, Thanos, ultimate villain uh, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a classic Malthusian, basically. He uses his power to reset the balance of population in the universe by snapping his fingers and killing 50% of all life forms. Uh, for Malthus, Thanos would have arrived uh, in the form of famines and war, destroying excess populations in a kind of feedback of the, of the uh, uh, environment with human populations. Uh, today, in present terms, Thanos might as might, Thanos might as well might as well arrive in the form of the climate crisis, right? <coughs> so, for Malthus uh, and for Malthusians, it is a contradiction between humanity as a whole and nature. There is no contradiction between humans. Uh, there is nothing going on at the relations of production. Humanity as a whole grows and consumes until the earth is forced to cull the population through crises. But again, going back to the Extinction Rebellion slide, which populations are being destroyed? Who will pay the prices for climate change? Will it be the same people who basically profited from climate change and created the conditions in the first place? The Malthusian model can't make, a sen can't make sense of this map, for instance. This is taken from the Decolonial Atlas. Uh, it shows the 100 companies most responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, where they're headquartered. Uh, and it also depicts the size of countries based on their uh, cumulative CO2 emissions from 1850 to 2011. So you can see obviously from this map where Great Britain is bigger than India, uh, that greenhouse gas emissions do not correlate with population nor do they correlate to richness and natural resources. They overwhelmingly correlate with capitalist development and colonial exploitation, actually. So not all humans are imp equally implicated in the uh, forces that drive climate change, nor are they equally maybe responsible for taking steps to avoid it. In fact, those most responsible today are least willing to countenance preventative measures uh, and at the, same, at the same time, least likely to suffer the consequences if climate change really does occur. So in order to understand how and why this is the case, we need to look more closely at in interhuman relationships. We need to understand how historical and social structures define the way humans interact with each other uh, economically uh, and politically, and then how human society overall uh, interacts with the rest of the planet obviously a very complex dynamic at the end of the day. So in order, in order to understand the previous slide, to make sense of these interhuman differences, we need to move from the Malthusian framework premised on human nature, uh, human growth, human consumption in general, to one fo more focused on different kinds of growth historically uh, and different kinds of production. 
uh, anticipating things we'll cover in the later session of the series. We can talk about differences between modes of production. The capitalist mode of production is a system premised on infinite exponential growth. It's not a question ultimately of personal morality or greed. Exponential growth is actually structural and systemic to capitalism. So there's no point in making a kind of uh, ethical or moral critique of capitalism. Uh, at the same time, while kind of the moral critique uh, is ineffective, it's possible to politically change the system. Uh, these structures have a social dimension and are subject to political change. Just as capitalism replaced feudalism, a new mode of production could replace capitalism. Different modes of production make possible and actually demand different levels of growth in order to challenge growth, in order to kind of curve that circle back into more of a uh, good infinity, uh, balanced reproduction. Uh, we need to actually think about changing the mode of production in the economy. Uh, so what is a mode of production? What is production? Uh, how is political economy political and in what under what constraints? This is what we're really wanting to talk about over the next sessions and into the future. Uh, but just to end on a final kind of concrete thought, Probably everyone is wondering whether a Green New Deal could make this kind of structural economic and environmental change. And we, we think that in order to understand what a New Deal is, in order to get a, a handle on what that means, both for architecture and politically, we need to understand capitalist crises and Keynesian economics. Uh, and that's going to be the focus of next week's session. Uh, but for now, let's take a break and open up the discussion. Uh, and then Eleni is going to pick up on, more on the history of political economy and get into more detail on some of the things that we discussed now. Thanks. So if you do, Rick is gonna moderate, I guess, but just to say if, if anyone has uh, a comment or a question, uh, we'd like this to be kind of open uh, please raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Or if you prefer, you can type it in the chat and one of us will read it out. Um, we're gonna try to, to, to discuss things for about 15 minutes, I think, before the next presentation. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Will. Uh, uh, Philip, you have raised the hand. Please, everyone who would like to just like engage in conversation on this. Uh, it doesn't need to be a question, it can just be your own thoughts and your experiences on discussing this issue uh, at school, in architecture, etc. cetera. Uh, Philip, you had, raise your hand, right? Mm. No, I, I used the applause reaction. <laughs> that oh, was it. Was I didn't applause. raise my hand. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was just, I was just like, eh. I would just like to say that it was a very good and pedagogical presentation. Thanks, Will. Uh, very nice. Uh, and I'd say I'd agree wholeheartedly. Five out of five. But uh, I think that's it for me at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Eddie, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you actually have the capacity to unmute yourselves. I don't know if I have to press the unmute button. I think we do have to unmute them. Eddie, yeah. Uh, Zoom says you are unmuted, but there's no sound coming. There may be some mic e issue on your end. No, no sound coming out. Uh, if you only couldn't like write a uh, question or comment in the chat, uh, if there's a technical issue. Um, okay, um, anyone else would like to say something? In the meantime. Rebecca, can you, can you mute Rebecca, uh, Rick? Sorry? Rebecca uh, has her hand up. Yeah. Again, I, I, 
There, um, there can you hear me now? Did it work? Yes, yes. Excellent. Um, so thank you very much. That was a really interesting uh, presentation and I enjoyed it thoroughly. And uh, like Philip, I, I agree. Um, I, I come at this from the perspective of law because I'm a lawyer and I'm wondering how you see, law was notably absent from your analysis. Um, and law obviously can uh, enshrine or undergird or you know, channel us in many, many different directions. So if you could just talk just a little bit about how you see law as both an impediment to change and possibly a catalyst for change, um, particularly, I guess, not necessarily, but particularly in light of the, the way the Green New Deal is floated as a quasi-legal um, uh, concept. Anyone? Will Eleni would like to take this on? Uh, shall I? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually don't think we will talk about law at all <laughs> in this session. I mean, uh, not because it's not important, um, but because um, if you're looking at uh, like social structures through the perspective of political economy, uh, law functions like to, to place it in like a rude, like basic, vulgar, even Marxist terms, law is a superstructure uh, of the problem, right? So you have a, cert a certain, a series of like infrastructural conditions at what level of what Marx usually calls the base, which are defined by the political economic relations, relations of production, etc. And those produce uh, social mechanisms to regulate and manage those relations. But Law is perceived as something that comes out of social relations that are more structural and then help uh, regulate and reproduce those relations. Now, in the, in the context of the political struggle, politics can change the politics, politics which functions at the level of superstructure can change the base by uh, establishing legal mechanisms that transform it, right? Uh, but these two functions as part of a political struggle. So there is obviously a political struggle to make legal changes. Uh, and these can be uh, relatively simple uh, or uh, legal changes within a, a certain social framework. Um, or they can be much more radical, even kind of revolutionary so, uh, legal changes that essentially destroy an entire legal apparatus and construct a new one. Uh, and in many ways, this is uh, the difference between that we will be exploring in the next couple of sessions uh, between what is usually called reformism in like left discourse, right, associated with Keynesian economics, so construction of welfare state social democracy, and the New Deal, which is acts in many ways through law within a capitalist structure, um, and uh, the revolution, which changes the capitalist structure, essentially destroys it and replaces it with a new one. Uh, and constructs new legal frameworks that uh, are regulating a different form of the economy, right? Uh, and yeah, we will be exploring how, what levels of legal transformations, at what level legal transformation and regulation can make changes and what kinds of changes it can make uh, and what kind of changes it can't make. And the problem then becomes deeper, right? Yeah, I, I would I would add that it's a it's a really good question because it points to uh, yeah the boundary between political economy and other disciplines, like including architecture, just as much as uh, law. And we'd have a similar argument for for the place of architecture here as the one Rick made uh, for law. And I think we probably will end up talking about law and architecture and other disciplinary things that that interconnect with political economy uh, as, as the session goes, as the sessions go along, especially, yeah, especially next week. But another, another kind of way, and this is getting, I think, fairly complicated maybe for the first uh, little discussion here, but another way to put it is that uh, dynamics in political economy, uh, and I'm quoting Anwar Sheikh, uh, classical political economist, uh, sort of define what is easy and what is hard at a given moment of time. So they set limits it sets limits on what is possible. Uh, so understanding uh, political economy helps you understand um, the larger forces that impact the kinds of uh, agency, the kinds of change that is possible in a given moment and what kinds of forms 
that change might take or that action might take. Does anyone else like to come in? Eddie, can you have you managed to fix the uh, audio, the mic thing? No, <laughs> you are still unmuted on it on Zoom. Uh, all right. Okay, we have uh, Max. Uh, yes, let me try and find you. Hello. Yes, it's working. Cool. Go ahead, Max. Um, hello, by the way, Ricardo. Nice to see you. And thanks mm -hmm. for doing this. <laughs> You've been good. Um, well, I guess this is a question for you, maybe yourself as well, Ricardo, and anyone else um, who's interested. But I just was wondering if you could unpack a bit more this sort of relationship between ethics and climate change. And I think you said that ethics is necessarily an effective or potent sort of, um, you know, force in trying to challenge this thing, but actually it's the sort of political sphere that, um, you know, these struggles need to play out in. But what I was just, I, I suppose I'm just wondering if, do you think there's any room for ethics? Why is it that you don't think that that has such a, uh, yeah, a, a enough power to sort of um, be effective. I remember Ricardo once you saying that you don't believe in ethics. Um, maybe, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's sort of um, what I was wondering. That's nice. Shall I start and then uh, Lenny and Rick, if you want to? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think, uh, I think there is, a, there is room for a kind of moral uh, argument, maybe an ethical argument about climate change. Uh, certainly in, in a political movement, building solidarity, uh, building, building the kind of political movement you need to develop uh, uh, an argument uh, using ethics and politics as part of that argument in order to build that, uh, that solidaristic coalition or whatever. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I think the the, the issue with, with ethics is that it places the uh, burden on an on the individual uh, seen as someone with basically the willpower to affect the system one way or the other, whether they're a good person or a bad person, an ethical person or an unethical person. Mm -hmm. So I think it's useful tactically as a discourse, as part of a political movement, but it's I, I would argue not the lever of political change. And actually thinking about things in terms of political economy uh, means thinking more in terms of how interests are at stake. Interests that all, often manifest themselves in impersonal ways in the system. So whether or not one is uh, an ethical uh, person or not doesn't necessarily affect the way uh, capitalist relations actually function. Like to be an ethical capitalist means still to rely on the relations of uh, exploitation on which being a capitalist at all depends. Otherwise, you go out of business. Mm. Um, so it's the, looking at political economy, again, sort of shows the structural limits that define what is easy and what is hard and constrain uh, uh, basically individual willpower or even collective willpower to a certain extent. Mm. Ricardo, did you have anything? Oh, if I could just make one more point. I think also that uh, part of the argument, the political argument, uh, uh, can be that it's in people's interests to prevent climate change, not because uh, it would make them a good person, uh, not because it would be ethical, but because it would be actually beneficial. So that's, I think, another aspect of the argument. Right. Yeah, I, I would essentially make the same point, but I would add something here. Um, now, obviously, I do think that, as Will said, uh, a, an appeal to ethics and uh, moral issues, uh, although also to self-interest, uh, is important in essentially mobilizing people for the struggle. Uh, we do that on an everyday basis uh, when talking to people uh, in, 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 interpersonally. 
the issue that we're raising here is not that ethics are like bad or morals are bad in absolute terms, but that setting the horizon of the struggle as a moral struggle or as an ethical struggle is the problem. The struggle is political. Um, and um, so mo using personal morals and ethics to push people into and mobilize them to the political struggle is important and useful. Uh, but it's not useful to set a moral solution. Uh, what we have generally as part of the moral, uh, uh, as kind of a practical effect of the moral solution is placing the emphasis on individual change, uh, change transformation of consumer habits, uh, et cetera, which is in many ways precisely what the capitalist mode of production wants people to think is the horizon of the struggle. Um, now, at, at, and effectively, moves away from the true scale of the struggle and the true scale of the structural transformations that are necessary. Um, the, um, again, this is a discussion that we will be having, uh, I guess, uh, over the entire cycle. The, um, but I think a key point here is that capitalism does not need the climate crisis to be in crisis. Um, I would actually even argue that uh, if there was no climate, if, 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 if it just so happened that there was no <laughs> natural limitations uh, for infinite growth, uh, if that just we lived in a different universe where that wasn't the case, capitalism would still constantly be in constant crisis and it would still be creating massive problems. And we, will we would still be having this event right now uh, if framed slightly differently. Um, and that, those internal crises that we will be exploring over the next two sessions um, of the current mode of production uh, that create tragic results, uh, famine and misery and war. Um, and war nowadays has a kind of an existential, uh, is an existential threat to the continued existence of the species, just like climate change is. All of these issues emerge from the internal contradictions of the current mode of production. Uh, and people have a self-interest in mobilizing politically to overcome those limitations. So even if capitalism wasn't creating the climate crisis, the problem would still be the same. Mm. And people's self-interest manifests themselves on an everyday basis as well, even without considering the climate crisis. And they, we don't need to wait for the cri climate crisis for people to feel the effects of the structural crisis that is ongoing uh, on their everyday lives. People are already feeling that. Uh, right now in the uh, economic crisis that is unfolding as we speak. Um, so it is those uh, crucial tensions that emerge uh, uh, in the political economic fabric of the capitalist mode of production that have as an outcome, as a natural and inevitable and desirable outcome, political struggle and the mobilization of people on the basis of uh, survival, self-interest, uh, etc. that gets people to work together with each other militantly uh, along, uh, so, uh, along several lines, which need to include today climate change, but are not committed to it. And so moral become, morality becomes political, and that's the point. Um, Steph. Uh, Steph, you, you are still you are still muted. I I think I oh, yeah. There you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 sorry, but uh, you are not muted on Zoom anymore, and yet we are not having hearing audio. Your it's a similar problem with Eddie, I guess. The microphone is not on. Yeah, this, it's, it's a technical issue on your end. Uh, uh, sorry, the microphone isn't uh, isn't uh, functioning right now. Yeah, maybe if you could uh, type the um, uh, the question. Yeah. No, of course, the typing is worse because you can't actually. Explain. Maybe we should go on to Eleni's presentation and then come back to these themes in the second discussion. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I uh, think there is one more question is, from. Um, yeah, uh -huh. on, on the, in chat, Michelle uh, says, could we also discuss the role of policy within law, civil and otherwise, and then integration and feedback loop within the architectural profession and legal mm -hmm. architectural bodies? 
Yeah, this is something that we will be covering uh, extensively next uh, in the next session, I think, when we talk yeah. about uh, our interventionist policies and uh, um, and the regulation. Uh, so, uh, if you don't mind, I, shall I shall I begin? If that's okay. Yeah, I think so. Uh, in the meantime, Evie and Steph, you can try to figure out what's wrong with your mic so you can uh, make your comments uh, in the next bit. Uh, okay. So bear with me for a moment till I uh, figure out how to do that. Mm. Okay, can you see that? Yes, no? Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, you can it's see working. the presentation. Okay, it's working because We're I cannot see you. You forgot you can't see us. No, no, no. I cannot, I cannot see you. I can only see the, the, <laughs> the, uh, the slides at the moment. So it's my computer. So, um, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I will try to pick up from uh, Will's last point and uh, focus a bit more on the uh, relation between economics and political economy. Uh, as uh, we last uh, just noted, technological optimism and Malthusian pessimism are presented as the answers to the current crisis. In reality, this is a false dilemma, since both of these options are oriented towards the management of consumption and the supply of resources instead of examining the relations of production uh, that cause uh, the crisis. Uh, so the second point that uh, we would like to make is uh, how the direction, this direction uh, coincides with an overall focus since the 19th century on economics rather than a political economy. So I uh, will try to address this through the presentation of a very crude and schematic uh, history, and I'm sorry to the uh, to people who have studied political economy, but it's necessary for the presentation. Um, so uh, political economy is uh, the intellectual instrument which is employed three, since the 18th century to analyze and discuss the phenomena, processes, and regulations that relate to the production, distribution, and accumulation of wealth. Uh, political economy operates uh, for the um, appears sorry for the first time as part of, uh, uh, of the treatise in um, uh, of uh, Antoine de Monte Christian's book uh, Traité de, de l'économie politique in uh, 1615. Um, the book uh, contradicts uh, uh, Xenophon's and um, Aristotle's statements that economy, which is uh, related to the administration of the household, is to be separate from politics, which are the affair of the police. Instead, it proposes that um, uh, the two need to be considered together at the scale of the state. So um, economic outcomes are influenced by political forces. Economy is political and must be devoted to the increase of production and wealth. The first political economy can be considered that of the physiocrats in the uh, six, uh, 18th century France, uh, who focused on the use of land and on laissez-faire uh, practices, with most notable representatives, uh, François Quenet and uh, um, Jacques Turgot. Uh, we'll discuss that uh, briefly in his presentation. Um, following by the classical political economy, which was uh, developed mainly in Britain with uh, William Petty, Adam Smith, and David Ricardo. Classical economic theory made the first attempts to understand the capitalist mode of production, which was emerging from uh, feudalism uh, while uh, industrial revolution was developing. Uh, it aimed to uh, a comprehensive analysis of bourgeois society, which uh, would reflect society's relations, and uh, in this region, uh, it is this reason that uh, uh, makes us makes us call it um, a political economy. Uh, so classical economic theory advocated in most cases um, the freedom of uh, market and uh, free trade in opposition to uh, pre-existing uh, mercantilist uh, uh, protectionism. So um, Adam Smith in um, The Wealth of Nations Propose the calculation of wealth not according to the accumulation of gold by the state, um, but instead based on uh, state's income. The income, of course, depends on labor, uh, on the labor of, uh, of uh, inhabitants organized by the division of labor and the use of accumulated uh, capital. So uh, labor, land, and capital are considered as the three main parameters of production. 
with uh, land property and capital held by individuals, income is divided between laborers, landlords, and capitalists in form of wages, rent, and profit. So there is a clear uh, class distinction in Smith's. And um, uh, also Smith, uh, most importantly, uh, considers that uh, value uh, was actually the result of uh, exchange. So uh, classical economic theory put forward an objective definition of value, although there was a controversy over which element uh, ought to be considered the source of value. Um, David Ricardo, in the principles of political economy and taxation, advanced the Smith theory on, of value and underlined that uh, the value of commodity or the quantity of any other commodity for which it will exchange depends on the uh, relatively uh, quantity of labor, which is necessary for the production and not on the greater or less compensation which is paid for that uh, labor. Uh, so he focuses uh, on, uh, on issues of, on, on value based on labor rather than exchange. Um, uh, however, in the uh, in um, uh, treatise of political economy, links link production directly to consumption. So uh, the law of market signifies a shift of attention from issues of production to those of exchange and consumption. In addition, uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, drawing on Bentham's uh, uh, ideas on uh, utilitarianism, utilitarianism uh, develops a method of determining the best utility and maximizing utility. These two ideas are going to be employed by neoclassical economics to develop a subjective theory of value, which is uh, dominant till today. Uh, Karl Marx, uh, in uh, contribution to the critique of uh, political economy and, of course, in capital, uh, breaks from these uh, classical economic theories and stresses uh, their methodological limitations and uh, weaknesses. Marx puts forward detailed criticism of political economy uh, and uh, its errors in, in relation to conceptions of value, uh, money, and uh, capital. So uh, Marx uh, opposes Adam Smith's theory of value as it did not include the quantification of past labor and uh, uh, the labor needed to create the tools, but instead considered that uh, value was determined in trade. In contrast, uh, Marx proposes uh, that uh, the economic uh, value of a good is determined by the total amount of socially necessary labor required to produce it. This is a theory that we will analyze in more uh, detail in uh, session three, uh, when we discuss in, uh, Marx in, um, in detail. So uh, Marx criticized uh, the subjective understanding of value by the bourgeois political economists uh, based on utility and exchange rather than production. He considers the new theories, which he names as vulgar, as uh, viewing the society ahistorically and the political economy as having a limited ability to address the problems of division of labor, ownership of means of production, class struggle, and the distribution of wealth. Following Marx and since the late 19th century, we see a gradual focus on economics rather than political economy. Uh, economics is used to refer to the narrow study of the uh, economy, absent of political and social considerations, and redirects attention from production uh, back to trade. As we will explain later, focusing on trade is basically focusing on issues of uh, consumption. This coincides with the development of neoclassical um, economics and the mathematization, uh, or one could say pseudo uh, of the field. So neoclassical economics uh, is an economic theory that uh, focuses mainly on uh, supply and demand as a di diving force is behind the price in consumption of goods. It considers the markets achieve equilibrium in uh, conditions of uh, perfect uh, competition. And uh, another uh, key assumption of neoclassical economics is that utility uh, to consumers and not the cost of production is the most important factor in determining the value of a product. So um, this approach was developed in late 19th century by neoclassical um, economists and continues till today, uh, especially within uh, neoliberalism. But uh, um, despite the belief uh, of neoclassical economics in conditions of perfect uh, competition and equilibrium of the markets, 
uh, these conditions are rarely achieved. Markets remain volatile and uh, we are experiencing the one crisis uh, after the other. So um, to address this, uh, most governments tend to intervene through a series of uh, policies. Uh, these policies take the form of um, either demand-side policies uh, following Keynesian economics, state intervention, and uh, market regulation, uh, or um, take uh, um, uh, the, the form of um, uh, supply-side policies following monetarism, deregulation of markets, and um, uh, the cut of uh, uh, cutting taxes. So uh, these approaches... Um, are also two approaches that we're going to discuss in detail in the next uh, in the next session and uh, going to discuss more about uh, the role of policies in um, also in relation to architecture. Uh, um, to conclude, Eleni, uh, the, the, Marx, uh, Eleni, Eleni. With... sorry, uh, Eleni. Uh, the, your sound cut immediately after your saying to conclude. With, uh, classical uh, political economy. I think it was abandoned. To, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, it, it's it's working fine. It had a, a little cut. Uh, you need to restart after saying the words to conclude. Okay. So this slide. Have you seen this slide? Uh, uh, the, and uh, the um, your share screen stopped. You need to share it again. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot uh, look at you while I'm looking at the it's slide. This is of the online era. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, These okay. are endemic to Zoom. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess so. Yeah, okay. So I'll start, uh, start the presentation from uh, here and uh, let me um, go back to Zoom and share. Sorry. Unfortunately, I cannot see things all together. So, yeah. It so, was exactly are you seeing that now? Conclude. Yes, it's working. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, to conclude, <laughs> uh, since uh, Karl Marx uh, broke with uh, classical political economy, political economy was abandoned from uh, economics, um, for economics, uh, which um, have been presented as independent science and are applied till today through different policies. Um, so from the 19th century uh, till today, one could claim that we are focused on fixing these consumption equations rather than thinking what uh, creates them. We are limited between false choices, whether to consume or not to consume, how to consume wisely. Um, and um, we think that it is time for a change of direction uh, to start focusing on issues of production rather than consumption, on political economy rather than economics. Uh, since political economy is um, exactly interested uh, in uh, these forces that operate behind uh, what we consider as uh, given. Um, but uh, one, of course, could wonder how is uh, political economy relevant uh, to architecture? So uh, as architects, we are operating within this socio-economic context. Uh, there is a need to redirect our attention to conditions of production in architecture, to issues of labor, and on how architecture can address social needs. So political economy can help us address issues of labor and production in architecture. Uh, and also, it, uh, they can help us address issues of um, uh, value, exchange, and uh, commodification. So uh, this way, uh, we think that we can avoid uh, false choices and confront the economic, political, and uh, ecological uh, realities of, uh, of um, uh, our profession. Yeah, so that was uh, I mean, what I wanted to, uh, to share, like a short schematic, crude uh, uh, history of uh, political economy, if it's helpful to anyone. <laughs> and I'll go back, I'll come back. Thanks, Eleni. Um, yeah, so I, I guess, um, again, we have, we're open to, let's see if Steph is now working. Go ahead, Are Steph. Now can you hear me? Yes, it is working. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm not an architect, and I um, uh, just found this uh, event on um, uh online and decided to come along. Um, I think there are certain uh, ways of looking at this problem uh, and you need to be more emphatic 
about things. Right. Um, the original slide put up the idea of climate change, and you did use the term Anthropocene and, and Capitalocene. Well, I think it's uh, incumbent upon us to use the term Anthropocene or Capitalocene um, and drum it into people's head, because this isn't just um, a climate crisis. This is all aspects of uh, life on Earth. Uh, the human being um, uh, has uh, been the most um, important for degrading the entire um, environment of the planet and the metabolism of the, um, the planet. Um, the, we are now officially in the Anthropocene and um, the, uh, the working group um, doesn't define it as human beings. It defines it as um, putting the blame on industrial capitalism and the imperial um, uh, countries, the metropolitan countries. Um, now, we have um, gone from 250 to 410 parts per million of uh, carbon dioxide. And it's already had a major, major effect, i.e. we have transformed the planet um, into the Anthropocene. Um, now, this, uh, when you look back at um, uh, the environmental movement in the post-war period, you had a recognition that um, things were changing on, on the planet and industrial capitalism was um, causing problems. Oh, 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 that, I, I, let me just say that the 250 to 410 transition, I forgot to actually say it, that is due to industrial capitalism burning fossil fuels. And there has been an acceleration over the last 25 years. Now, people like Hansen, when they first appeared on the scene, they gave an indication that 1%, uh, um, 1 degree centigrade was the tolerable increase in, uh, the, uh, in, in the planet's temperature. This was modified to 1.5 by a series of um, uh, meetings in, uh, the, in the 80s. Um, that was then adopted, and I think incorrectly and, um, and surreptitiously done, uh, we've now got to a figure of 2%. Uh, one thing that you did mention uh, in terms of neoliberal uh, economics is that Nordhaus, the um, economist, um, got a Nobel Peace Prize for suggesting that we should do nothing about this until we got to 3.5 degrees um, centigrade. And that's something to discuss. Um, the other thing I would say that within this uh, 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 topic, the, the most important polluter on the planet is the Pentagon. And war and the military are the most important emitters of greenhouse gases, both in terms of the amount of uh, petrochemicals that they use, but also in the construction of their vast fleets, the destruction of environment and the release of carbon dioxide, and in the construction process, post-war construction, the emission of CO2 from concrete. Now, in this... Um, post-war period in this recognition that uh, man was having an effect upon the planet or um, uh, you had Rio and then the UN conferences which have done bugger all in that time to change matters because this is a separate organization that does not address the real problems now, after 25 rounds of COP and um, absolutely millions of meetings, um, meetings coming out of your ears, we've still got no solution to this that they propose. Now, crystallizing um, uh, the uh, 
the debate is coming down now to the Green New Deal, which is being pushed by what I would call climate capitalists, corporate environment uh, environmentalists, and you have no vision of the future other than cap capitalism will continue and replacing um, fossil fuels with rare earths. And we, we continue um, our imperialist nature. We continue our, our accumulation. We continue behaving as the same uh, as we have done in the past under the green banner. Uh, uh, what else? Oh, yes, and architects. Architects. Um, you have to look at the whole of the, 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 um, the process going on in um, this society. What you're building, who you're building it for, and is it sustainable? I would suggest that gigantic infrastructure projects, prestige buildings, high-speed rail... Um, uh, new um, uh, road networks, uh, et cetera, um, should be challenged. And uh, the profession, I think, <laughs> you, you, you are responsible, you people sitting there, for something like 10% of uh, CO2 admissions on, on the planet, you know, the building and construction, uh, et cetera. I'm not, really blame, I'm not really blaming you. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, yeah, I mean, many of these discussions, I think, will be like, especially this last one, the issue on like infrastructure and what that means. Right? Uh, uh, and uh, what the Green New Deal is in the sense of effectively envisioning a solution to the problem within the capitalist uh, 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 structures. Um, so I think this, this, in many ways, these particular, particularly these two points are at the core of uh, what our uh, uh, what what we'll be exploring in the next uh, two sessions and in the symposium. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I personally would agree, for example, with uh, the uh, uh, notion that infrastructure is like inherently evil. Uh, although I do think that infrastructure is in the current moment that, <laughs> but in the, like the specific direction that is given to it is a direction that is given to serve the uh, needs of uh, the capitalist crisis, not to serve the needs of the global crisis, um, to help capitalism overcome its needs while maintaining, its, uh, uh, while maintaining itself, not to solve the external problems, uh, the problems that capitalism creates. Um, but I do think that the solution to that will probably require a very large infrastructural, uh, massive infrastructural, in fact, transformation, but with a radically different direction. Um, anyway, this is a kind of long, I suppose, a very complex uh, discussion. Um, Michelle, you, you left a long uh, message. Would you like to, like, speak? Uh, yeah, let me just find you. If you don't raise your hand with the raise hand thingy, I need to find you in the whole list. Oh, there you go. Cool. Uh, I'm new. Okay. Yes, yes. Thanks very much. Um, I, I have I have many concepts, so I tend to um, throw a lot of diverse ones at people. So I'm going to just try one strand of that, and I hope it's not too simplistic. Um, but what I feel is that um, the main thing that has driven a lot of this problem is has come from uh, my very like small understanding of economy in the sense of, of needing to produce. And we also even talk about the production of space. And the word production um, it seems to be this kind of measure of our economy and measure it's a, it's a huge place of measurement within the the current system and just in terms of in a, in a very basic sense well first of all i think we need to you know there's there's come up there's so many different economies the blue economy the red you know there's there's many brown holistic green 
um, full cycle economies. So people are looking at holistic economies and we, we're now looking at these various different, if you like, full cycle systems. And um, I come from an architectural background, but I've had a lot of experience in uh, permaculture and biodynamic agriculture and um, yeah, just different ecological systems and terrain analysis systems. But I find that really, um, I find a lot of the problem comes in in, in the way that things are cop, cop, compartmentalized, even in government, <clears throat> they, the way water, services, electricity, um, people, production, economy, all of it is kind of segregated. And I think the mistake in, in even in our professions, we, we used to be very siloed in our professions. Now we're a lot more interdisciplinary. We're starting to see the value of integration, of diversity, um, especially now with COVID, the, the Black Lives Movement, um, the Green Movement, the Crisis Movement, we're all moving towards understanding. So in the, in the more general sense, as a general picture, we, we're understanding that these previous systems that served us to get to where we are um, within their kind of uh, narrow definitions are going to serve us a lot better um, where they start to intersect and work collaboratively. And in fact, we, it, we seem to have these very simplistic one-sided, we have many um, sophisticated sort of one-track systems that need to now integrate into one complex whole system. And, and the, the easiest example is nature because it's the most efficient complex system that we are born into and that also we need to cooperate with and work with. And so, um, then just as an idea or, or just as an approach, um, you know, like just in terms of the basic thing of now wanting to reduce, recycle, upcycle, having different um, methods, you know, like a, or, or, or just t taking the agricultural cycle as, as one example, and there's the human cycle, like we, we can do in terms of Waldorf or other education, we can take it into different fields. But if we work with just agriculture, we could see having a, uh, how we have biodynamic we have complementary plants working together, we have systems working together that are more integrated, that are aware of um, larger systems like cycles, seasons, suns, moons. And when, it, when they're working together, um, sorry, my video is becoming unstable. Uh, w w when things work together, they're actually more efficient. And so, so places sometimes like Japan or different other places, they're not looking to produce anymore. They're not looking at the economy of saying, okay, yeah, we're making like 50 million cars. You know, we're going to earn more yen and our economy is going to be better. It's understanding that, no, actually we want better quality. And it's very easy to see and as it's more sustainable, it's more long-term and, um, it's, it's very easy to see that in, in, in this example of, of agriculture where we're in a biodynamic agri agriculture, uh, the soil is taken care of, a lot of um, chemicals and herbs are put into the ground, the, the soil is very nourished, a very rich fertile place for, for, for new growth for different seasons that, that can be easily replenished and the quality that arrives are you know vitamin intense, nutrient intense, um, the geometry is actually structure of of the vegetables or the fruits of what they're growing has an integrity towards it that is health giving. So the way one consumes structure yeah. that one consumes is, is health providing. And so one can take that now also into the labor system. If you want to look at this labor system that we're talking about in terms of architecture, it's ironic to think that we can build architecture that is enlivened, that is humane if we're tired. If you're tired, my boss sometimes says, if you make a, if you're tired inside of yourself and you are strained and you can't concentrate, are you going to make a quality design? Are you going to make a beautiful line in your architecture that's going to enliven and bring a sense of humanity? Are you going to be able to think of the sensitivities that allow our behavior to perform better? Will you have the human attributes to be able to bring those qualities into the quality of space that we want to produce and the kind of humanity that, that, that needs to be reflected, and, you know, and, and where, where people have found that, you know, buildings that have natural materials or that do have good geometries or that are sensitive to context and site or even young girls, urban design approach. Yeah. Um, we get a better quality human, we get a better quality building 
Um, Sydney Opera House is the most iconic building in the world. It took eight years to develop and lots of fights. Michelle, um, sorry, can, can yeah. I, sorry, sorry, so, sorry, yeah, that, that's like it. A lot no, of detail and it becomes kind of long. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, so the, the sum up is basically integrated and quality versus uh, compartmentalized and quantity. So just yeah. sort of, yeah, to sum uh, up, yeah. <laughs> Will and Lenny, would you like to? If that makes sense. Eleni, do you want to say something? Oh, I really don't know how to address that in a, in a short uh, in a short comment because I think that's uh, the, the the process of discussion we are having now. Uh, it is, uh, but uh, what I was trying to show exactly with this uh, with the previous presentation is exactly this uh, um, uh, focus in the uh, the last uh, two centuries in um, on quantity on exchange and all this kind of thinking. And, and the, the problem is now how we make the shift from that and we we change the focus. Uh, from these uh, priorities uh, to new priorities, to different priorities, I guess. But that's a very difficult. Oh, your your sound your sound got garbled. Yeah, go again. Maybe I could pick up there. Yeah, I think that's really well put, Eleni. And I think the I mean for us the question is why are things compartmentalized? Why certain kinds of growth? Why certain kinds of quantitative production uh, are favored rather than others? And our argument is that it's not, it's not for philosophical reasons. Uh, it's not because people have wrong ideas at the end of the day. Um, and I, I think we can sort of recognize that even if certain kinds of awarenesses have been growing, uh, massive catastrophic crises continue to occur. Nevertheless, uh, so it's a question for us of what the material relations are behind that thinking and behind those practices. Um, so we 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 agree, I think, on the on the on some of the technical and organizational uh, recommendations you made. Our our question, as Eleni said, is how do you get there, and why is it so difficult to get there? Yeah, uh, and I think it's. Uh, like the core idea uh, in this event cycle uh, and why we, for example, talked more, Will in his presentation talked more about the specific issue of the climate crisis as kind of an entryway into the problem, uh, which of course is one of the key crises that we need to address uh, and possibly the largest one. Um, mm -hmm. But we moved from there to uh, Eleni's presentation, focusing squarely on the issue of, uh, on the development of political economy as a field, uh, because uh, what I think is becoming increasing, uh, an increasing perception uh, uh, that we have been uh, having in general, I think, uh, in society, and uh, we feel it in our teaching practice, uh, as, as, as Vaughn just said in the chat. Um, the, um, we we can discuss and uh, uh, in in like in uh, intricate detail uh, the technical transformations and policy transformations and etc that we need to do and that we can do with the means that we have today uh, to transform and avoid and uh, 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 eff effectively uh, address the, the 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 crisis. But if we don't have a political economic structure that enables it to happen. As, uh, and, and this is a key idea. This is not an issue of changing mentalities to change society. The social, the, the society and specifically its political economic st uh, structures establish limits and conditions on which changes can be made and that they cannot transgress. Uh, it is impossible within the current mode of production such as it exists to degrow. Uh, it's just impossible. It's also impossible to establish uh, uh, large-scale mechanisms of uh, 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 planning that implement policies that uh, not only stimulate but even force uh, some of the changes that Michelle was now uh, detailing. Um, these issues 
uh, run against the intrinsic needs of the current mode of production so that the current mode of production does not allow, it is simply not possible to do them that way. And why and how they intersect and are conditioned by that mode of production is what we want to explore in the next couple of sessions. How does this mode of production operate? What are its internal drives? Why does it need to spiral in a continuous infinite expansion? Uh, are there alternative modes of production that do not require infinite expansion? Uh, how do you move from one to the other? Uh, why does that uh, drive for moving from one to the other exist? Uh, it's the political dimension of political economy, can et cetera. I, can I make a connection to Eleni's presentation here too? Yeah. Uh, there's a point early on that Eleni made about the false, false distinction really between politics and economics. There was the classic Greek philosophical distinction. I think part of the argument of our, of our sessions here is to challenge the segregation of politics from economics. Um, and I think I detect, and this may not be your, your point, but in the distinction between uh, quantity and quality, uh, or in framing economics as a mentality, uh, our argument is that economics uh, in the form of political economy, it just is the material relations of society. And for too long, uh, basically, since for the, entirety of the neoliberal era, uh, economics has been ideologically dominated by a certain framework that Eleni dis discussed at the end. Uh, we want to challenge it on its own terms or transform the terms. We, we don't think we can afford not to understand political economy or to question it from outside on the basis of alternative ways of thinking or alter alternative qualities. We really think in order to get to those alternatives, we need to begin with the material relations of society. Um, Eleni, do you want to pick up on this? Also, if questions for Eleni could be, could be made, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, I guess I, a lot of, um, there's a kind of an impetus to talk about the climate crisis in general terms, um, since it's kind of, we, we chose to, uh, frame the problem uh, through that lens. Uh, but in general, we want to discuss political economy itself uh, precisely to, to address uh, the, how it establishes conditions and limitations so that we can think about transforming the political economy in order and as a process of transforming and addressing the climate crisis too. So political economy needs to be looked at also like on its own terms and its own, as its own framework. Yeah, and exactly. These are the the, the the work that we'll try to do through the in the next sessions. Um, and actually, we wanted to do in in more detail if you had the the, the time and space in the school to um, uh, to create open seminars or or have uh, this this uh, more detailed discussions. Um, yeah, I don't know if there are any other. I think Teresa has uh, uh, has raised her hand. And, yes. Uh, shall I try to? Teresa, go ahead. Hi. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, I think it's a great uh, platform. Um, I guess mine is uh, more an invitation. I'm, I'm trying to pick up on the first comment, and I'm sorry I don't have you on my screen, about um, legislation. And, and then um, Michelle was talking about... Uh, uh, interdisciplinarity and how much we can learn from nature essentially as a system and uh, Steph reminded us what we we architect are, are, are doing to uh, the planet and, and, and our responsibility and I was thinking at, at these um, interventions together with your presentations and thank you so much for looking really at the roots of, of the problem, I think. Um, but I think um, as architects, uh, the, the very definition of, of what we do is all of these things. So this interdisciplinarity uh, or uh, non being in uh, compartmentalized boxes is proper of nature, but it should be also proper of architecture. Um, so I, well, we'll continue the conversation, I think, in the coming sessions. But I think it's interesting because the ultimate 
continuation of the conversation will be in the studios and in the different projects and in the way of doing it because legislation can be challenged by architecture and architects need to um, look at uh, very carefully at how they uh, procure for their buildings and uh, they can also refuse to uh, produce certain uh, designs. Uh, and the example of permaculture, it's becoming almost a paradigm for um, uh, reinventing and rethinking the, the project. So um, I don't think mine is a question, is more just an invitation to carry on all these topics in uh, the next uh, session and the ones after. And um, not forget, and thank you for uh, reminding us that uh, at the bottom of it, there are big issues, but we can still, um, maybe a small dent, but not very a small dent, something we, we, we can do. So yeah, just thank you. And thank you for the, I think the interventions, which uh, uh, said everything about architecture. <laughs> so I just wanted to <laughs> defend the, the discipline and, the, and claim a certain well, a certain a, a serious responsibility. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Um, yeah. uh, I think maybe that's a good talk. If, if someone else doesn't have a question or uh, an urgent uh, comment, maybe it would be a good time to, uh, because we are over half an hour over the time that we meant to cover. Um, so I don't know if there is a, a good point to... If anyone would like to raise anything else. I do think, uh, if I can make a comment on Teresa as well, um, that um, obviously it, it's like these uh, organizing events like this wouldn't make sense if we didn't believe that uh, uh, architects and people connected to the discipline uh, can uh, work in the necessary direction. Um, but I think uh, a key issue, and here is where, like, as Will was making uh, uh, a point earlier uh, on the issue of uh, law, um, like law, architecture functions, um, and this is kind of a, a, an issue that we will be exploring probably even more than in these sessions in the in the uh, symposium. Uh, architecture as a field, as a discipline, has a role, but it's a weak role. Uh, and uh, what weak means here uh, is what we will be exploring. Uh, but I, 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 without, again, without the structural conditions within which uh, there can be a structural transformation of the very mechanisms through which architecture is produced uh, and the political economic conditions within which it is produced, which to address the, the scale of the crisis requires um, effectively a kind of a large global strategic reorientation, reorganization of the construction industry as a whole. Um, the, the contribution that our architects can make in challenging the legislation, in developing uh, technical concerns and the technologies and mechanisms of design that uh, can produce better outcomes, all of those are will be extremely limited in scope and will not be capable of addressing the, the scale of the problem. Um, and so, like, for example, uh, an environmental lawyer can be looking at the issues of legislation and how existing legislation contradicts uh, the, the, the political necessity of transforming uh, the economy. Um, the same, uh, the, 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 the lawyer cannot, the, the lawyer cannot even know themselves produce those transformations in law. They can campaign for it, but the problem becomes a political problem we move from a legal problem to a political problem because the problem becomes uh, where are the political economic conditions within which those legal transformations can be made. And so it becomes a, an issue of constructing a political uh, opposition and transformational movement. Um, and it's the same, exact same thing for architecture. Uh, and there is a certain tendency in architecture to think we can start making environmental projects and then incrementally by accumulating many environmental projects and by accumulating more architects with a change mentality that can uh, have in introduce the environmental concerns in their architecture, we accumulate, if we, we, cumulati you, we cumulatively uh, achieve a kind of a grand sum where all construction is environmental. And we don't think that's true. 
uh, <laughs> uh, it needs to be kind of the other way around. The, what the, of course, architects campaigning for environmental architecture is crucial, because not because they can do it, but because they won't be able to do it, and therefore show where are the political limits that prevent that from happening, and therefore explode the campaign into a political into political militancy, where architects are simultaneously acting as technical agents, but also as political agents. Uh, and it's not that the architecture is the politics, it's that architecture shows the need for political transformation that then needs to be uh, campaigned for and worked through at a political level, right? And I mean, I, I, I'm sure that's what exactly uh, the framework that you were talking about as well, Teresa. I think we can start by uh, first becoming aware <laughs> of yeah. the, the political conditions and, uh, and uh, then... Sorry, I think I, 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 I muted you. Yeah. I, yeah, you muted me. I just wanted to disagree with you, but at the end you said what I wanted to say. So the architect is not the one who builds buildings, it's also the one who makes politics and uh, is the activist and, uh, and many other things. And so is the lawyer. The lawyer doesn't only do that. So you've, now I can't disagree with you today, Ricardo. <laughs> Thank you. You can mute me now. <laughs> Okay, uh, are there no more contributions? Oh yes, absolutely. Putting policy in briefs, important. <laughs> okay, I mean, if there's no more contributions, I guess, uh, I hope to see you all next week in the Sexton session, specifically on the Green New Deal and Keynesian economics, we'll be exploring how, what is a New Deal, what has been in the past a New Deal, or the European version of it, uh, usually called the welfare state or social democracy. What does that mean in terms of how it conditions and regulates capitalism? What are the internal drives of capitalism that tend towards New Deals in certain specific moments? And then we can discuss if there are, in the contemporary moment, conditions for a new deal and what it would mean today. Um, and I suppose necessarily looking at the problem of the new deal from the perspective of the, of the contemporary perspective in which the new deal was addressing crisis of liberal capitalism, but the new deal itself ran into crisis which triggered neoliberal capitalism. So what is what are these crises? How do they function? Okay, uh, thank you so much everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.